You remember that after 9-11, they said that a nuclear plant could not be uh, impacted by a jet. That was kind of the general common wisdom. And the NRC has since come out and said that, yes, if a full jet, 747-type jet, slammed into a nuclear reactor, it would break enough or jostle enough of the containment uh, to create an accident. So that, that has been reversed, and it hasn't really been covered by the media. Well, and they used to run a, 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 a story that said that these casks that they transferred the waste in, where you could shoot at them and they would, they would withhold, withstand a, an attack. Finally, CNN ran a video of one being blown up, and I guess that dispelled that myth. Yes. But we, it, it's sort of like, who are they gonna, what are they going to trot out next, and then mm -hmm. we have to refute all this. I think that that uh, uh, the nation really needs to take a good hard look at this and make a, a, a very scientific and balanced discussion and analysis. Uh, I think when they when they take a look at all the ups mm -hmm. and downs of the whole thing, they'll they'll agree that this is not the thing that we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we should do what has happened in other countries where they've gotten rid of all of them. One of the things that Amory Lovins points out, who's a you know a well-noted energy expert, is that. Uh, if you combine conservation, not cutting back necessarily, but energy efficiency, if you combine investments in energy efficiency, like better air conditioning systems, better refrigerators, uh, dealing with better lighting, you combine that with a, even a, even now with higher cost photovoltaics, if you combine that, it's still cheaper than investing in nuclear power, considerably less. Uh, one of the things we we also haven't talked about, I mean, besides the, the the terrorism, which of course gets everyone's attention, is what happens in the day-to-day -day operation of these plants. Are there slow leaks of uh, radiation, and are the people who are living near these plants at risk? Well, every eight days they release a cocktail of gases um, that are built up in the reactor core. Uh, and they hold them, they have a holding tank for them, and after eight days they release um, gases that are, uh, they're about, o they're over 100 isotopes that go into the air, cesium, strontium, and you can, there's just a whole list of them. And you can, uh, some people are attributing the, uh, in the radical increase in thyroid problems, which didn't used to be a real national issue uh, 40 years ago. To, to that gaseous release. Other people are saying it's that combined with certain types of plastics and uh, different, different chemicals that are in the environment, but it, it's probably a component. Steve, let's talk about uh, this topic, but Palo Verde. We're here in Arizona, okay. and uh, I understand there have been a lot of problems at Palo Verde in terms of routine operation and maintenance. And, and I think most people know that Chernobyl was a result of, of uh, just an operator error and a routine technician botched a test. I mean, that's pretty frightening. When that's not even a terrorist attack. That's just routine operating procedure. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's happening at Palo Verde? Well, let me say this. Every year they run, they have a, they run a drill of, you know, in case something goes wrong. And I, and I always find this really fascinating that there's a 10-mile evacuation area. Now, now they're currently concerned that now housing subdivisions are being moved in within the 10-mile radius, and they're wondering how they're going to be notified. They're going to do telephone ring-down systems and a siren. But there will also be a 50-mile radius, uh, an advisory, in essence, not to eat the radioactive dust. And that's it. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't think that's, that's not exactly what I thought of as an emergency planning and response. Um, there have been, whenever something happens at the plant, like one time I got a call from all the news media because a whole bunch of ducks had just keeled over and died there, and they thought, oh, radiation. And it was probably more to do with the chlorine they used to keep their pipes clean from algae. A little burp of chlorine killed all the birds. But it just goes to show that we're all sort of a hair trigger with that. And the other side of it is, if you really had to evacuate, that isn't really, it isn't feasible. You can't get around during normal situations. <laughs> it's gridlock everywhere. So if you had to get out, you, you can't. 
But there have been problems, uh, some of the other panelists can probably talk better about it, but uh, where 20 years after they built the thing, they discovered that one of the cooling systems really didn't work where it was supposed to, and they almost closed the thing down over that. They had to come in and have a special meeting. And you, and you really, I, I'm very skeptical of government regulatory agencies. They tend to be captured by the people they regulate, and they look upon the public and people like us as their adversaries. And indeed, they're, we're the people they're supposed to be serving. But they, they exist to license and allow these facilities, and they have an interest in that. Now, the uh, NRC did a report. Uh, it's the Union of Concerned Scientists report, and just a brief one, on the Palo Verde. Uh, and it's, it's titled, How Palo Verde Made the NRC's Naughty List, in time for Christmas here. And uh, they, they are pointing out that Palo Verde's record uh, is so bad that there are only three reactors that have worse records out of the 103 nuclear plants in the United States than Palo Verde. And they, they, the NRC is thinking about moving them into a worse category, basically toward an F. Aren't they talking about building two more reactors? Well, they are talking about that, uh, which is ironic. Mm -hmm. And EPS mm -hmm. is also announcing that unless they get this rate increase, their, their bonds will become junk. Mm -hmm. And you're, well, okay, so if if you all go broke, who is stuck with this big thing in the desert? Okay. Expensive mm -hmm. Because a lot of the original partners of the Palo Verde nuclear power plant bailed early, including Tucson's municipal utility. Mm -hmm. A judge ruled uh, recently that uh, the waste has to be cared for for a million years. It used to be the standard was 10,000 years. Okay, well, a million years, can you imagine Arizona Public Service being around for a million years? Uh, that that's like uh, thousands of generations of human generations, thousands of 70-year generations. Amazing. Let me just take a little break here to um, Steve, give your website to people who are watching. Oh, they can find us at don'twastearizona.org and also at chemicalspill.org. Okay, very good. Um, you mentioned the NRC and um, I think this is a loaded question, but uh, again, how good or how bad a job do you think they're doing in terms of regulating, you, or is this a marriage between them and the nuclear industry? Well, the Nu Nuclear Regulatory Commission is, there was a study done on them recently uh, that said that 60% of the people that go into the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, come from the industry, and 60% who leave the NRC go into the industry. And they also did one on the FDA not too long back, and it was pretty much the same percent. These regulatory agencies are, they, have, they call it the regulatory revolving door. Mm -hmm. And you come in, you go out, you come back in, you go out. <laughs> and it's, it, and you know, some people say, well, we should have an isolated group of regulators who can't go to the industry or vice versa, but then you start getting into ivory tower type management and not real mm -hmm. experience kind of management. So. And would Congress even buy or promote that kind of approach? Well, and an another problem with that is if you've gone, got your schooling and you have the degrees you need to work in this field, well, you very much are going to, you're not going to destroy your career by going, you know, this is, this is really a bomb that's ready to go off and mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't work again and everybody you know, <laughs> they don't work again. Uh, and this has been a problem really in, early in the nuclear industry. This came up as an issue that you can't, you can't dare say no that this is a problem and this could be this terrible thing. Otherwise, you won't work again and you get blacklisted and that's the end of you. So it, it has, you know, they, those people have been purged well, one way or the other. So you all have all these people who are going to be singing the line but may not really believe in the song, but they know they better because their paycheck depends mm -hmm. on it. Is it true that the courts have ruled that the environmental impact is not a part of the relicensing of nuclear plants? And that, or, or that complaints about them that, that they don't have to worry about the environment? Uh, it's been isolated. There, there are things that have been isolated out, but there still is an environmental impact statement process mm -hmm. that's required for any nuclear plant. Uh, but they, they've started to take more and more issues out of the localized debate. So you can't even bring them up anymore. Yeah, and they, they want a generic. They don't want a generic environmental impact statement. Mm -hmm. Is their proposition for the new round of nuclear power plants? So mm -hmm. that would not be specific to your site, your population dynamics in the area, your evacuation capabilities, mm -hmm. the experience of the operators at your utility. All of that would have no impact on the local level. It would just be a generic matter of oh, we've decided that they're safe. So.